Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and I did a video, well, the previous video that I'll link to below about SSH, key management, how to set up your SSH keys. So I wanted to go a step further. A few people asked about how you manage SSH keys in terms of what do you do with them? How do you manage like a central server, like a jump box? And why is that important? In, I'm not gonna get as far into setting up like a whole bastion server, which you can look that up as well as another alternative. They're very similar, but there's a couple key differences, which essentially is the bastion server is gonna be more something you pass through. A jump box is gonna be something that holds the keys because then you control access to the jump box and control each person's keys on there. And the jump box then has a key so you can get to the other servers and you lock this down really tight so you can you know, delegate access from there. But there's different ways of handling it. I'm gonna talk about them, give an overview and give you some ideas of how to set these things up. But first, if you'd like to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hires button right at the top. If you'd like to help keep this channel sponsor free and thank you to everyone who already has, there is a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you're looking for deals or discounts on products and services we offer on this channel, check out the affiliate links down below. They're in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store. We have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics you've seen on this channel. Now back to our content. All right, and we're gonna talk about this right here, and this is draw.io. And this is a uh, free program. I've done a whole video on it because people always ask what drawing program do you use? I really like this one, it works well. And it's free, by the way. Windows, Linux, cross-platform, even has a web interface. But this is the office, and we've set up a demo here, and this is my house where we're also going to connect to for part of the demo. And we're gonna show a couple different things here. So the first one is the jump box. What is its purpose? Well, instead of putting on all of our other servers, so you have all these servers in the office, and do you want to give every person their own set of keys to the servers? Maybe, but that has a scalability problem. If you put the keys and you have all these different computers that have primary keys, SSH keys that allow access to these servers, well, that becomes kind of a challenge because one server can have a lot of different keys on there. So if we let each person generate their keys and then add to those keys to the servers. Now, when you have a small administration team and you're managing a few people, that actually works. So let's say I have like three people who are my engineers that need to be able to get to these servers because they regularly work on them. I can manage the keys individually with those servers. And that actually, like I said, works out rather well. And if someone leaves the team and we need to revoke their access or something happens that maybe compromises their keys, each key is listed out individually so we can just go through and remove that person's keys. And we're gonna cover how to do that. But why would we have a jump box then if that's as simple as that is? Because the jump box becomes a choke point, if you will, a point of really tight security where we log everything that comes to or goes out of the jump box. And I've seen this in high level networks where they put a jump box that is the only box allowed to manage the networks. So no devices on the network or servers on a network will take commands from anything that doesn't originate from that particular box. And then you control very strictly the egress for anyone that can even get to it. And then of course you lock down their keys and then you only have to manage your keys there. So the jump box may contain the keys to all of your infrastructure and is the only command and control server that the infrastructure will listen to, which then you can just create even restricted firewall rules. So, you know, even if someone were to exfiltrate the keys off the jump server, you would have rules on each one of your devices that say, nope, if those keys didn't come from that particular IP address, well, that's the only one they'll listen to. Now, these are different methodologies and why you may want to use a jump server for these reasons. And it just, you know, a way of locking it down and becoming the central way of doing this. Now, usually, and not for purposes of demo, but usually you want to put that on maybe a separate secure network. And then you put it on a, a firewall rule that says only these boxes can even talk to the jump server. And then you can even put egress rules again so that server can only talk to it and you can see how you can really you know build a solid firewall around this and a solid rule set around there so we're going to talk about though what is the jump box and generally speaking it's uh, linux servers are the most common that i've seen uh, we use a debian system for ours we keep it pretty simple you 
tighten it up, lock it down. And I mentioned in a previous video, turn off password authentication completely. Make sure you have a strong password on it in case someone does get to the terminal. And I'm gonna go a step further. And when you set these up, make sure they have on boot encryption. And the reason for on boot encryption for like a jump server is gonna be, what if someone got a copy of your backup of your jump server? What, well, you know, I've even seen jump servers can be as simple as a Raspberry Pi. But if you do something like put a jump server as a Raspberry Pi, you have to make sure that in some way, there's a decryption method because if someone were to pop the little SD card of a Raspberry Pi, for example, or as I said, get a copy of the jump server itself, well, they would be able to extract those keys. If they extract those keys, they are, depending on what other mitigations you have in place, much closer, whoever these people that took your keys are, are much closer now to getting into any of your servers. But having it central versus everyone's got a copy of the key and we exfiltrate one server and boom, we have keys that go everywhere. That's why you may want to centralize it to this. Now let's get to some of the functional parts of actually doing this. Um, and then we'll get to the uh, more advanced pivoting through networks. And right here is we catenated the .ssh authorized keys files. And we have Tom at Detroit Yodeling Company, Bob, LTS, and Hans. And if you can see at the top here, we have Hans, Tom, and Bob. And what each user has done, now granted for purposes of demonstration, I didn't spin up multiple different machines, but for each individual user in Linux, each user has a .ssh folder and they have the pub folder. So this is the Hans, and you can see that this matches plus DE0 slash BRUF, blah, blah, blah. And you'll see that same one down here. So we have the same key installed. So with the key installed, we can just up arrows, I believe I already have it in here. And we'll log into our jump box, which is SSH jump at 192.168.3.168. Now you probably don't want everyone logging as root for jump boxes. They just don't need to have root access at all. They just need to have a user that contains the keys, which should probably be separate than root. So we created a user jump and we copied the keys over. And now we're in. So Hans authenticated with the key is able to get in and we can do the same thing here and the same thing here. So each one of these users can really simply and quickly log in uh, to this jump box. But what if we decide to get rid of a user. Well, no problem. We can go here and we're just gonna go ahead and edit the .ssh key. So .ssh, authorize keys. And uh, let's fire Tom. I'll, uh, if you're not familiar with Vim, DD deletes one line. WQ, right quit. And uh, where's Tom's the one in the middle here, so we exit. I can't get in. Well, it's prompting me for a password. I know I said turn password authentication off. I highly recommend that. I didn't for the demo. I apparently skipped a step, but you should turn password authentication off. It should actually say denied when they try to log in. So now Tom can't log in. But what if we wanted to put Tom back in and there's no password authentication? Well, we just got to go to .ssh, get the key, .pub, and we would just copy paste this back in. Well, it's gonna wrap across the screen, but you get the idea. We copy and paste this in, put it back in the authorized key file, and away you go. Now this can all be scripted and automated because you can know someone's key, you can push it to that jump box. Uh, you can have one of the other users that does have access add that user back to the jump box. Um, but this is a way you can easily manage each individual user. And when I was showing the SSH keys, that's why I was saying how you can create each user like this um, and put a tag in there. So I can just look at the keys and go, yep, that's that person's key. And once again, you go a step further, something like Ansible or some type of automation uh, scripting that you could really build in, you could say, go everywhere that this person has keys and remove them. What about the jump box itself? Well, the jump box itself has a different set of keys. So it's authorized keys means these users, any users we add in there are allowed to log into the jump box. Then the keys on the jump box, those are the keys of the kingdom. We place these on the other servers so that like I had said, they first have to, each user goes into the jump box and then from there, they can pivot and go into the other networks. And anytime you're setting up a new system or adding something, you usually have those keys predefined, the public key. And I mentioned before, like DigitalOcean, whenever I spin up a new DigitalOcean server, they already have my key on file. You can also put these keys in your GitHub account. There's a lot of public places you can put them and make them as part of your setup process when you're setting up a new system. I believe even Ubuntu server, when you load it, can ask you for your GitHub account name and just automatically pull the keys. Your public key can be, as the name implies, publicly available 
available for people to get things uh, started and have you log in. This actually applies to how we'll handle things for clients. We meet a new client, they go, hey, can you SSH into this particular server? I'm like, yeah, here's my public key link. Just download it, put it in there. Matter of fact, for people go, I'm not real comfortable with Linux, I can send you a one-liner that basically grabs it and then at the next command is, you know, appends it to your authorized key file and away we go, I can get into that system and only I can get at that system because of the way public key and private key pairs work. As I kind of mentioned in my last video, once you have the public key established, you can give it away as long as you don't give away your private key, but that's a great way without exchanging any passwords and clear text that people can allow me access and go from there to get into their systems. But let's talk a little bit more, a little bit more in depth about how you would pivot inside of one of these. So this is really the basic part of the jump. The next one we're going to talk about is how you would pivot to get to more information. So we're actually going to go ahead and exit some of these and talk about the second part of the demo here. All right, back to the drawings. We're going to take my laptop at 192.168.3.18. Then we're going to use the YouTube jump box 192.168.3.168 and all the restrictions apply, you know, we'll pretend that we've set this up securely and that we didn't forget, and you should always test this, that we have password authentication turned off and we want it to be able to get to other servers. And uh, not just servers that are local, that would be too easy because, well, that just works. We're gonna show you also how to add a VPN into the mix and how that might work and how that might look. So the goal is gonna be Tom's laptop here, YouTube jump box and get to FreeNAS. Now, you see if we had the keys installed on my FreeNAS at my house, that would be no problem at all because then we would just bypass the jump box. But we're, you know, assuming that we've locked things down and we want central management of the keys. So we have one primary key on our jump box and then we'll jump over to our FreeNAS box because it has that key, but there's not a key on this laptop to manage this FreeNAS. Now, let's go back over here and go to the terminal. So we're going to SSH into jump at 192.168.3.168. And because this is on a system that doesn't have direct access, we're gonna to have to get over to, because I can't ping right now, anything into 192.168.1 network at all, or of course 1.8. So we're gonna to have to VPN over on this one. Now. For those of you that always ask, I am using TMUX to be able to split the screens and uh, we're gonna split them more than once. So the other thing you can do with a jump box, perhaps you wanna build VPN files. And I don't necessarily recommend having an auth file for all of them. And I, when I bring up what an auth file is, that has the username and password in there. So when we were, if we were to, and I'm not going to, cause it's actually my house VPN, which has all my, uh, keys and signing in there, you can also specify an open VPN. Maybe I'll do a separate, more in-depth video on how to do this, uh, but it basically, you can build an auth file so it automatically logs in. I did it for convenience, and I'll have to type in passwords to make this video easier because my passwords are complicated. And we're gonna go ahead and kick off OpenVPN, which we also have installed in the jump box. So SSH, I'm sorry, sudo, not SSH, we're already SSH'd in, OpenVPN. Now, because we're using user jump, and user jump is in the sudoer file, so it's allowed to run privileged operations, and you have to run OpenVPN as a privileged operation or it won't work. Well, it may actually connect, but won't work properly if you do that. I've seen people make that mistake before. So sudo OpenVPN, and we're just specifying the OpenVPN file. This is something else you can keep on your jump box, maybe several different OpenVPN files, so you can go into that server and you know connect to different networks that you can then jump into to do administration. Uh, someone had mentioned before like having a VPN to every single client. That gets challenging to have that many VPNs open at once. Um, it's definitely uh, a lot. Now we do have to enter the sudo password, so we will enter that, and it's going to connect. And yes, I do know right there is my home IP address, uh, 69.14.103.125. That's why I'm using this one, so it does display it. Now, what we've got here, and now we can SSH jump again. I'm still on my laptop in this bottom window. That's why it says pop top right here. So we'll go jump at 192.168.3.168. All right, now I'm in the jump box. And if we do IPA on the jump box, we have, there's our address there. There's our tunnel network and we go back over here and what we've done is I'm 
SSH'd into the jump box. Then the jump box has created a VPN tunnel going across and it's talking to my PF Sense box over here. This is the intermediary tunnel network that OpenVPN uses to get the routing across. Then from there, we can pivot over to FreeNAS because I now have access to here. So if I actually looked and we went and let's like just do a ping 168.1.8. Now it's going across the tunnel and away we go. And to kind of show this a little bit further, if we do a trace route to 192.168.1.8, we go through, it hits the 69.1, gets rerouted and adds this to the route table. So you kind of get an idea of how it travels across that tunnel intermediary network, which is a function of the way OpenVPN does its routing. But then from here, we can log in 192.168.1.168. So now we can, oh, I'm sorry, 1.8. And I'm out into my free NAS at home. So that's great, but what if I wanted my laptop to have a browser connection that went over there? That would be kind of cool, right? So if we don't, don't just connect, we want to connect to this and have a browser that works on my computer from here, but pivots through the jump box bridges across the VPN so I can get to the interface for my free NAS. That would be great. I'm gonna show you how to do that. It's actually pretty easy. So we're gonna go ahead and exit, exit. So we're back on my laptop. And then we're gonna put a dash D 9050. SSH minus D 95, jump. And then we're going into jump box. It's actually the same login. What we just did is we created a tunnel and we're gonna use proxy chains to traverse that tunnel. This is where it gets really interesting because first, let's say we had everything locked down so only the jump box can VPN in. Then we have it locked down so only certain people can access the jump box. But now we still wanna have browser. I need a browser to get to that web interface for FreeNAS because that's the easiest way to administer it, but I'm restricted from doing so unless I go through this jump box, but now we're gonna cover how to get in there. And proxy chains. So I've done a video before on proxy chains and we'll just open up a new tab actually to make it so I don't have too many things open on there. And it's proxy chains. And I already have 9050 set up. That's the same default one I used prior in my proxy chain videos, which I'll link uh, down below. And we're going to fire up Firefox. And now we're in. So we'll go back to the drawing real quick here. We went from my laptop to the jump box. The jump box has a VPN tunnel going across here to the PF Sense. And now because of proxy chains, my local browser running on my computer and we spawned Firefox with the proxy chains command is going to allow me, whoops, uh, to forget my password because I save it in a really more complicated password. I realized that I probably don't have the credentials to log in. I'd have to get those somewhere else like with Bitwarden or wherever you store your passwords. And now you're getting the idea of how you can use your system to pivot in. But what else can we do from there? What else can we run? Well, when you're pivoting in a network like this, proxy chains, you can wrap really anything in and as long as it's using a protocol, so right here we did proxy chains Firefox, we can also do proxy chains SSH, line 2168.1.8. I do have my keys installed for my particular NAS at home on my computer. So now we're wrapping proxy chains and my computer locally doesn't have access, but it does here. So if I were to remove the proxy change where it doesn't try to go directly, I don't have access but by putting proxy chains in front of it. Gaspell proxy change, right? Once you're done with all the typos, you can see that by wrapping in proxy chains, I'm now pushing it over. Now, one thing of note is ping won't go across proxy chains. Uh, it is a dynamic forward, but we, were not, we will not be able to ping things across it because it does not accept ICMP traffic in this configuration. So it's sending it, but you notice how proxy chains has an error right away for that. So there's still some network functionality that may not work, but a lot of times for general administration purposes, what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve is 
really basic uh, you know, browser access and things like that because you need to get to something that's on the other side that works over TCP. Sometimes that's RDP, sometimes it's just opening up web interfaces to administer different devices on another network and or a client's network especially. So by combining these two devices like this, it'll work. Now, for a little bit more advanced technically, and we'll talk about this, what if I'm not at my office? And what if I'm VPN'd into my office? Well, that actually works too, but there's a certain limitation. So let's say I VPN to my office. So I take my laptop and we're gonna take it home. And I have a VPN going from here to my PFSense firewall. Then it bridges me over and I'm authorized based on the VPN IP address to get to the jump box. And then from there, we can go to having uh, access to the VPN that goes across here. But this is a little bit of a challenge I have seen before and there's not an easy workaround for it necessarily. But what you have is if the VPN tunnel is the same on both sides, like the tunnel I'm using in, if it was 192.168.69 slash show 24 for the VPN that's going on the jump box and the VPN, for example, coming into my office, the jump box would be confused as to where to send the data back. So you can have network overlap problems still, just a side note in case you are doing it double remote like that. It can work, but you can't have overlapping networks, which overlapping networks is one of the biggest reasons that, back to that question someone had asked me before, can I just build VPN tunnels to all my clients? That's great until you have several hundred clients and they have crisscrossed VPNs because somehow they've, especially when you inherited an already built network, they may have the same range assignments as another client. And if you have VPNs in a both, how do you know which one to route to? Well, you have to bring the tunnels up individually for each one. And that's kind of the way you manage it. So you can spiral off. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And as long as you're doing them all secure, you've got these VPNs set up and don't just leave text files like I did. I guess I did it for convenience of the video. Um, for these VPNs, have complex passwords uh, for when you do log into them to help mitigate access. Everything's about, you know, trying to mitigate risk. And that's what security is really about when you put these together. So hopefully that makes a little bit sense of how you use a jump box, how you handle some of the keys inside of it, and how you uh, delegate access to it and how you can keep all that. And of course, you go a step further and do some extensive logging on that box. You'll know each person that logged in, you can then track where they went, and you only have to focus on centrally logging one device so you can understand your ingress and egress and where those people went. Now, one other note, uh, people have asked before about administering a lot of systems at scale and to go back a little further to what we do here as a company, because mostly we're doing Windows servers, this is less of an issue for us. We have fewer Linux servers and a lot of Windows servers you do, and we use still tools like SolarWinds on that. So if people want to, want to ask, like, what do you exactly do here, Tom? Some of it's handled through the jump box, but trust me, the majority of what we still do on a daily basis here has a lot more to do with uh, managing Windows servers. So uh, we're doing that. Just thought I'd leave that note on here for people asking for you know a few more details on that. And I've covered my tool stack, of, uh, SolarWinds things I've used on this channel before, and I'm, I'll eventually I'll do an updated video on that. But that's generally how you manage a lot of Windows computers at scale. Not to get too off topic, but just thought I'd bring that up and mention it. I'll leave links below to the proxy chains video, to the Tmux video for you who want to, those of you that want to know how to use Tmux, and also uh, the SSH key generator video, which I just released the other day. I'll leave links to each of those so you can kind of go off and read a little more if you'd like. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.